Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering. And this is module 24 in my computer networks lecture series, where I talk about TCP and UDP headers. Now, you'll have noticed, and I have discussed um, in the past during this lecture series, that you know I don't tend to go into any one protocol in a huge amount of detail. So if you do find yourself making a living in network operation or network design, at some point you will have to become very sort of intimately familiar with a particular communication standard. Maybe um, you're provisioning IP networks and you need to sink yourself into what IP is all about. Maybe you have a job with a cellular provider and you need to learn a, a particular cellular standard. Regardless of what it is, at some point you're going to have to, you're going to find yourself being, um, having the opportunity to read a standards document. And standards documents tend to be very long, very detailed, and very full of things like header specifications, packet formats, um, all that kind of stuff. And I try not to get into that level of detail too much in this lecture series because instead I want to focus on kind of the fundamental problems and challenges that network design has to contend with, regardless of whether we're looking at our specific wireless standard or a particular wired um, standard. And so my hope is that what you're going to get out of this lecture series is sort of kind of the enduring understanding of how networks behave and operate regardless of the particular protocol standard that you're working with. Um, that being said, every once in a while there is value to diving down into the details and that's what I'm going to do here. So this lecture module is kind of a little bit of a intro or companion module to uh, module 25, which is where we look at a TCP session in detail. So we're going to look at all of the control packets that get sent back and forth when setting up and tearing down a, a TCP session between two nodes. And in order to understand all of the detail that we're going to be looking at, we do need to um, examine specifically the different fields that you find in a TCP header and what they all mean. A lot of it is going to be kind of just showing you where certain things are implemented that you already understand. So things like port numbers, for example, um, we've talked about what port numbers are. You'll just see where they fit into the, the TCP header. And um, tacked on to the end of this discussion, I'm also going to introduce very briefly the UDP standard, talk about how it differs from TCP and what its header looks like as well. Okay, so let's dive right in. So to start off, um, the first four um, fields in the TCP header, the, fir the first are given in this slide. The first two are the port numbers. So we have a source port number and a destination port number. Port numbers are, are 16 bits, as we've already discussed. And the difference between these two values is um, the source port is the port number on the machine where the packet is being generated. Um, the destination port is the port number we want to connect to on our destination machine. So for example, if our computer was connecting to a web server, the destination port would be port 80 and the source port would be whatever randomly generated port number our operating system decided to assign to this particular TCP connection. The next field we have is the 32-bit sequence number. And as we've talked about, the sequence number is basically the byte index of the first byte carried in the payload of our um, TCP packet. And we initialize the sequence number to the initial sequence number, or ISN. Um, the ISN can be basically anything, but um, quite often we uh, um, we'll see zero used as the ISN. And uh, the sequence number wraps around, so it wraps to zero after it reaches um, two to the 32 minus one. And that's no problem because we use Windows and so we're never gonna have more packets outstanding than two to the 32. And so the wraparound doesn't cause us any problems. 
The next field is the acknowledgement number. And the way TCP works is um, we don't have like a special dedicated header or packet type for acknowledgements. Instead, the acknowledgement information is just embedded in the standard TCP um, packet header. And that's so to allow us to kind of piggyback acknowledgement information on a data frame that's going in the opposite direction. So typically data frames are being sent back and forth between the two nodes. This just allows us to piggyback acknowledgements. Sometimes, however, frames will be sent with no data payload and with just acknowledgement information in the frame as we're gonna see. And of course, as we've seen in our, our previous modules, the, um, the value of the app number is basically the index of the byte that the receiver is expecting to um, receive next. And so that means everything up to and including one minus the acknowledgement value has been received successfully in order by the receiver. The next field we have is header length. The reason why we have a header length field is because the TCP header does support optional sort of control information that might be present in the header or it might not. And as a result, we can have a variable sized header. So um, following the header length, we have six reserved bits that are used for nothing. And you know, it's, it's fine to have reserved bits, I, I guess, on, on some levels, but as we're going to see, this is, this can be kind of a dangerous thing from a security point of view, because when we, when we talk about security, we'll see that, you know, sometimes malware traffic that, that's trying to, um, you know, covertly or secretly exchange information will sometimes intentionally set things like these reserved bits to particular values so that other malware programs can recognize um, malware traffic. Following the reserve bits, we have nine flag bits. The first three, nonce, CDWR, and ECN echo, we're not really going to talk about very much. They're used for congestion control. The next um, flag is the URG or urgent flag. When this is set, the urgent pointer is valid. And um, we'll talk about the urgent pointer in a second. This is basically meant to um, sort of expedite or prioritize this packet being delivered to um, the, the higher layers of, of the protocol stack, but it, it, it's not really used anymore either. Um, the ACK flag is definitely used. So when the ACK flag is set, that means that the header contains valid ACK information. If the ACK flag is zero, then the header still contains an ACK number, but that ACK number is not, not considered valid. There's PSH or the push flag. The push flag, if this is set, then it means that the data packet should be immediately pushed up to the application layer. Sometimes different TCP implementations will buffer several packets together before um, sending them up to the application layer, but the, the push flag forces that applicate or forces the, the, um, the frame to get pushed up to the application. The reset flag is if this is set, um, we abort the connection due to some sort of abnormal conditions that may have occurred. And the SYN and the FIN flags, as we're going to see, are used for connection setup and connection termination. And we're going to see those featured very prominently in the next module where we go through our TCP session example. Finally, we have our window size. And we've talked about that already as well. This is the number of bytes the sender of the packet is willing to accept before a, um, an acknowledgement needs to be sent. So this is the sliding window ACK field. The checksum field holds the internet checksum that we've studied when back when we were looking at error detection. And then following the checksum, we have the urgent pointer. And if the urgent or URG flag is set, then this urgent pointer value was meant to be used to send the, uh, the data in this TCP packet 
quickly up to the application using kind of a side channel provided by the operating system rather than just going through the regular sort of protocol stack socket interface. And this isn't really used anymore because it's not really super compatible across multiple operating systems. And as a result, this is another bit of a security concern in TCP. So whenever you have a field that isn't used, again, as I was saying, malware can use this, use these unused fields to store, um, to store values. There are going to be a few of the optional TCP header fields that uh, we're going to see. Options can be contained, or the, the options field can stretch from zero all the way up to 352 bits. And there's a whole bunch of different purposes, but the more common ones will be, um, is related first of all to uh, the maximum segment size or packet size that the sender will accept. There is um, a field that indicates whether or not selective ARQ is allowed. This window scale is a very common field. So if we go back, we can see that the window size is only a 16-bit number. And that's often too small. Sometimes, especially for like really sort of high data rate, high throughput applications, an application will want a larger TCP window than what can be contained in 16 bits. And so this window scale field scales up the window by a factor of two raised to the exponent of whatever is in the, in the window scale. We then also have some timestamp values that are used um, as well that sometimes show up. The user datagram protocol or UDP you can think of as a super, super stripped down version of TCP. Uh, so TCP provides all this functionality, the, the acknowledgements, the sequence numbers, all kinds of things to make sure that the connection is very reliable and looking from the user perspective. However, all of this overhead and this calculation does tend to slow the connection down a little bit. And sometimes applications just want very simple, very raw communication. And it, when that's the case, they tend to opt for UDP. UDP tends to be used for things that send very simple communication packets and things that tend to not want very out of date information. So one thing about you know the selective repeat ARQ is that you know packets can get buffered and they are delivered reliably but at the cost of increased delay. So for an application like a an internet time server for example, you just want to get that packet out there and if it gets sort of um, caught up in a, on a congested link. You don't really want retransmission of old time information. You would just prefer that packet gets lost and then, you know, have a more up-to-date packet filter through again at, at some point. Many games, many network games will also use UDP because you want that real-time game, game information. You know, if you... Um, you know, if a packet is delivered reliably but late, then you start to get some lag in your gameplay, and that's um, generally seen as unacceptable for a lot of game players. And so UDP is basically just a super, super simple thing that gets bolted on top of an IP packet that essentially provides port numbers and not much else. So if we look at the UDP header, it's super simple. We've got our source port number, our destination port number, the total length of the UDP packet, and the internet checksum is included as well. And that's it. So again, no acknowledgements, nothing like that. So it's important to be aware of UDP because many of you, if you develop application software, will be using UDP. Um, again, particularly for sort of gaming and kind of real-time type applications. 
Um, however, from a protocol perspective and a session management perspective, there's really not much to it.